Hi, welcome to podcast number three in MA2286, Advanced Calculus. In this podcast, I want to consider Stokes' formula for the case of a zero form in one variable. As Stokes' formula involves the notion of a derivative, which we've not yet explained, I'll begin by explaining what we mean by the derivative of a zero form in one variable. So let omega be our zero form in one variable x. So omega then is nothing other than a smooth function, capital F of x. So we can regard omega as a zero form, in which we'll, I'll write omega, or sometimes I can regard it just as a function from first year, and then I'll write it as capital F of x. The derivative of omega as a zero form is a one form. In general, the derivative of a p form is a p plus 1 form. So the derivative of omega is the following one form. It's the one form consisting of f dash of x dx, where f dash of x is the function uh, obtained as the derivative of the function capital F of x. That's it. No more, no less. So let's let's do an example which should should help to to um, make that clearer. Suppose that we have the zero form omega equal to sine of x. That's certainly a smooth function. Um, then its derivative d omega is the one form cosine of x dx because uh, the derivative of sine is cosine. So with the uh, notion of derivative of a zero form under our belt, we can now state Stokes' formula as a theorem in this setting. The theorem is then that for a zero, for a differential zero form omega on a, a closed interval s from a to b, we have the following equality. The left hand side is the integral of the zero form over the boundary of s, so this, this, this set of, of two points a and b, that integral is equal to the integral on the right-hand side, which is the integral of the derivative of omega, the one form, over the region S. So the right-hand side is the, the kind of integral that we, we were happy uh, working with in first year. And what I want to do is uh, give this theorem a, a, a proof. Um, hopefully you'll spot that the theorem is just a way of writing the fundamental part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, which was proved last year. But let's 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 do a proof again. Um, so in order to to give a proof of this, let let me recall that the right hand integral. Uh, informally, it's an area under a curve, but more formally, I suppose we think of it as a Riemann sum. So let me let me recall that. So. The more formal definition of the integral of f of x dx from a to b is as a limit of a certain sum of f of x nu i times the difference xi minus xi minus 1, where, well, let's start by saying that the xi's form a partition of the interval from a to b. So um, x0, x1, x2, up to xn is an increasing sequence of numbers starting at A and ending at B. That's a, what we call a partition of the interval S from A to B. The new I's are chosen arbitrarily within the interval from Xi minus 1 to Xi. And then what do we mean by the size of the partition P? Because we take the limit as the size of the partition tends to zero. So the size of a partition is the maximum difference between an Xi and an Xi minus 1. Or if you like, it's the maximum absolute value of Xi minus Xi minus 1. And that is a, a, a recalling then of, of what we met in first year as the, the, the formal definition of an integral. So now let's start on a proof of the theorem. Uh, and I'll, it's a rigorous proof I'm going to give, but I'm going to give it in a very informal language because it might just help. So um, let me begin by 
considering the, the railway line from Galway to Dublin, and let's just imagine that this railway line is a straight line. I'm going to think of this railway line as being the x-axis in um, the xy plane. Think of the railway line from Galway to Dublin. Imagine that it's perfectly straight and, and imagine that it's really part of the x-axis. So, let's suppose that we have a train travelling from Galway to Dublin and that the train has a speedometer which works fine but let's imagine that the, the mileometer is broken on the train so the driver of the train at any given time won't be able to look down and record how far the train has travelled. Um, but we can imagine that the driver has a stopwatch because all train drivers have stopwatches. Let little f of t, lowercase f of t, denote the train speed at time t. So when we're in Galway, I suppose time is zero, and then whatever the time is when it, when it arrives in Dublin, you know, two or three hours later. So let f of t denote the train speed at time t. And let capital F of t denote the total distance travelled at time t. So lowercase f, small f of t, the train driver can read off the, off the speedometer, but capital F of t, the total distance travelled, can't be read from the because the mileometer is broken. And in order to make this mathematics and not just a story about train travel, uh, let's make some assumption. So let's suppose that the function capital F of t is smooth. Uh, so we'd better assume then that, that its derivative exists and it's second and so on. And so if its derivative, uh, if all these derivatives exist, then they're all continuous as well. So uh, in particular, the first derivative, f dashed of t with respect to t exists, and the rate of change of distance is what we call speed. So f dashed of t is actually uh, another name for the, the case lowercase f of t. And lowercase f of t is a continuous function. And it's probably important at some point that lowercase f of t is, is continuous because we do know from first year that we can integrate uh, continuous functions. Okay, let's continue. Now, suppose that the train driver wants to at least get an estimate of the distance travelled by the train at any given time. So the train driver has a stop clock and that can be used. So, so to estimate the distance travelled from say the time A at Athen Ride to the time B in uh, Ballinasloe or wherever, um, the driver, could, the driver could, could do the following. The driver from time to time at various times t, t0 equal to a then t1, t2 up to tn equal to b, at various times um, the driver could look at the speedometer and measure the speed at time ti. And the driver could also uh, re keep a, a record of the, the, the time intervals. What's the time interval between ti minus 1 and ti? Is it a minute or a minute and a half or 30 seconds or 40 seconds or whatever? Um, and all and, and I guess the more often that the driver takes a, a, a recording, um, the more accurate is the estimate. And so to, to estimate the, the uh, distance travelled from time A to time B, the driver just has to, to work out this, this sum. Um, okay. So then the an estimate of the distance travelled between time A and time B, I suppose, is the, is the, the, the unknown distance travelled uh, at time B minus the distance already travelled at time A, and that 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 difference is what we'd like to estimate, and we have this estimate on the right, this 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 sum. Um, so now what we could do is we could take limits. If we take a limit of the partition, as the as the partition uh, t zero t one up to t n, as as the as the size of that partition diminishes, you know, so the distance between the ti's decreases, uh, we actually get inequalities. We get that the left-hand side here, f of b minus f of a, now becomes equal to the limit of the right-hand side. And as we saw on the previous uh, page, this limit is by definition what we mean the integral of f of t dt from a to b. So equation star... Um, 
is important for us in the proof. So the limit in star exists uh, because f of t is continuous. Okay, so I'll just go back. Uh, this limit, I suppose limits don't always exist, but if, if f is continuous, uh, we saw in first year, then, then the limit exists. So that's handy. And then if we set omega equal to capital F of t, the distance traveled at time t, and if we take s to be the interval from a to b, then we can rewrite equation star. The left-hand side, what is the left-hand side? The left-hand side, f of b minus f of a, that's just another way of writing the integral of omega over the boundary of s. And the right-hand side, we've seen, uh, is, sorry, I've gone the wrong way. The right-hand side is this, this integral, which is what we mean by the integral of the derivative of capital F. Because remember, lowercase f is the derivative of capital F. And so that does it. That's the proof. Okay, um, so we have a proof. <clears throat> now let's finish the podcast by using the theorem. And we've uh, you've you've met this kind of application in first year, but uh, I, do, I want to go through one example because it probably is a good idea for you to refresh. Uh, your your ability to apply this fundamental theorem of calculus. So the example I've chosen then out of the, the Schaum book is let's evaluate the integral from 0 to pi of the function 1 over 5 plus 3 cos x dx. Now that's a regular uh, first year, I suppose, uh, calculus problem. So let's work on this. Well, using the theorem, we can start our calculation as follows. If we could find, if we could find a zero form omega such that the derivative of the, the zero form omega happened to be equal to 1 over 5 plus 3 cos x dx, that one form, then using the theorem, what we'd have is that the integral of the thing, that, you know, the, the integral we're trying to find over the whole interval from 0 to pi would be equal to the integral of the zero form omega, just over the boundary of zero and pi, which by definition would be omega of pi minus omega of zero. So if we could find omega, um, we'd be done, because all we'd have to do is evaluate omega of pi, omega of zero, uh, take the difference, and that will be the, the integral that we're looking for. So really then what we need to do is find a zero form omega whose derivative is equal to the thing we're trying to integrate. Um, okay, so now uh, it's a good example because it'll remind you of, of, of substitution tricks. So, so um, there are yeah various substitutions that might, or many substitutions won't help, but some substitutions will help. So let's let's have a look. Here's a substitution that will help um, in this case. So experience, if you practice lots of these integrals. Uh, you, 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 you get a feel for what substitutions can help. And in this case, it turns out that substituting u equal to the tangent of x over 2 will help us. So um, let's suppose that we've been told that that substitution will help us. How do we actually use that substitution to find a, a function or a zero form omega whose derivative is equal to this? Well, if we do the substitution omega equal to tan x over 2, uh, let's just remind ourselves, then that means that if we've got a right-angled triangle um, with uh, bottom side of length 1 and the opposite side to the angle of, mark of length u, then the tangent is opposite over the adjacent, so the tangent of, of x over 2, this angle, would be u. But then from the same triangle, we can work out that the sine... Uh, the opposite over the hypotenuse will be u over the square root of 1 plus u squared, and that the cosine will be 1 over the square root of 1 plus u squared. Um, so all of that might be useful in, the, in, in applying the substitution. Let's also note, when we do substitution in, in you know, finding integrals, we're really using the chain rule for differentiation. Um, uh, and we, 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 in the technique for substituting, uh, tells us that 
du. If ever we're going to write a du, it should represent um, the derivative of x dx. So du, if you like, this one form should equal this one form. Uh, the derivative of tan is is sex squared. So the derivative of tan is sex squared, and then the derivative of x over 2 is a half. So you, you get this. So whenever we see a du, uh, or whenever we want to write a du, it, sh it should mean this quantity. So we have this equality of one form, I suppose. And rearranging it, um, which is probably the form we need it in, it, it, we can say that uh, we can replace dx by 2 cos squared x over 2 du. And knowing that um, cos is u over the square root of 1 plus u squared, we can rewrite that as 2 over 1 plus u squared du. Um, the cosine of x, as opposed to the cosine of x over 2, the cosine of x, <clears throat> cos of a plus b is cos a cos b minus sine a sine b, so using that you get the cosine of x over 2 plus x over 2 is cos squared x over 2 minus sine squared x over 2, but then using these values for sine x over 2 and cos x over 2, you, you can rewrite that as 1 minus u squared over 1 plus u squared. Okay, so that, that page gives us uh, all the information we need about f for applying the substitution. And now let's apply it. So we're going to apply this substitution to this, this, um, this integrand here. Wherever we see an x, a cos, cos x, we know how to replace it in terms of u. And whenever we see a dx, we know how to replace it in terms of u. So let's do that. Um... So, I do those substitutions, I replace cos x by this yoke and dx by uh, the, the correct you know, substitution, and we end up with this, and then you, it's, it's a little bit of algebra to rearrange that, to simplify that in terms of u's, uh, and you find that all of this, if I've done the sums correctly, comes to 1 over 4 plus u squared du. And then you say, how on earth do we integrate 1 over 4 plus u squared du? So you could either do another substitution, maybe u equals sine theta, or you could just look up the logbook. But one way or the other, you'd find that the, the that that indefinite integral. So here I'm I'm working indefinite integrals from first year. Um, you'd find that that would be one half the inverse tan or arc tan of u over 2. And then... Probably we'd want our answer in terms of x rather than in terms of this, this u that we're substituting. So to, that can all be rewritten in terms of x as a half inverse tan of a half of tan x over 2. So and and there's a constant when you when you when you're in first year when you find indefinite integrals you're always told to, to choose a constant to, to say that plus an arbitrary constant c but I'm only interested in finding one particular, any uh, zero form uh, whose derivative is, is, the, is the integrand. So we might as well choose c to be the simplest constant possible, zero. So I've chosen c to be zero. Uh, and then we could, what this says is we can take our, our zero form to be this yoke here. So now what do we need to do? Well, we just simply need to calculate that. Um, zero form that function omega at pi and calculate it at zero and you do that and you'll find that uh, that comes to pi over four so this integral then that we we wanted to calculate um, is equal to pi over four and you know that that's an illustration of uh, how that theorem can be applied and you did meet the theorem and that kind of application in first year so maybe one more thing I should say is that in first year, you didn't do an awful lot of, of uh, techniques of integration. You just did, did a few and did them fairly quickly. It would probably be worth brushing up your technique techniques for, for integration. Okay, So you'll find a lot about techniques for integrating functions of one variable in the Schaumburg, and I suggest that you, you, look, you look at those. Okay, thanks for listening.